I think that's the other part of it too, right, Lisa, in, in sort of um, preparing for this moment, I guess I'll refer to it. Um, you know, we, we knew that this investigation was ongoing. It, it was launched last year. It was publicly announced that U.S. soccer mm -hmm. had retained the services of Sally Yates in order to do a very, you know, large scope investigation like this. Um, and here we are a year later um, talking about it. And I think part of the build to that too was a um, was very interesting to note because I think there were some folks out there who maybe anticipated that the public would not have access to this very thorough report, um, that perhaps there would just be um, something small, something shorter that just sort of uh, summarizes um, the very lengthy timeline in which and how this investigation occurred. But ultimately, as of uh, yesterday, Monday, October 3rd, um, that's we now know that that's not the case, that mm -hmm. U.S. soccer and Sally Yates uh, has give, have given access to this uh, full, again, uh, over 300 page uh, report. So it, it is uh, out there and accessible for people who want to comb through um, all of the lengthy things and new details uh, within it. Um, but something that came out obviously of, of this report and the investigations were, were recommendations um, as well. Part, part of this investigation and part of this year long, uh, report was so that there would be next steps. What are recommendations and next steps to, to come out of these results? Um, and those are highlighted, um, within, within this full report as well. Um, some of the recommendations uh, listed are as follows, um, and Yates states in the report that ultimately should be applied uh, federation-wide, uh, not just to the NWSL or to professional leagues. Um, number one on this list of recommendations is transparency. Uh, transparency, A, abusive coaches able to move from team to team, even to U.S. soccer because it was failed to identify misconduct and inform others when necessary, and B, teams should be required to accurately disclose misconduct. And two was accountability. Um, point A, there are no guidelines regarding a team's necessary due diligence prior to hiring a coach. And point B, that U.S. soccer should require meaningful vetting of coaches when necessary, licensing authority to old wrongdoers um, being accountable. The third... Um listed the third recommendation listed is is clear rules um it says that ussf's policies and procedures are patchwork and that there's no single policy that's going to cover every single organization member or, or govern all types of the behavior that's prohibited within this so they they suggest um adopting a uniform of these clear policies and, and making them codes of conducts that apply to all members and make them accessible in a single location on US Soccer Federation's website. They also talk about player safety and respect, saying that US Soccer Federation and the NWSL should designate an individual within each of these organizations to be responsible for player safety, someone for these players to go to, to talk to that cannot retaliate against these players and will actually take their concerns um, and, and act upon them. Um, there are two final uh, points of recommendation within the report. Seven is discipline. Um, that in light of these findings, results and discipline is warranted. And the final point is um, uh, intersection with safe sports. So about eight, um, clear recommendations out of the report to U.S. soccer, again, uh, wanting it's suggesting that they be applied federation-wide and not just to NWSL or professional leagues. Um, and and, and youth soccer, that mentioning <laughs> mentioning youth soccer, saying that the soccer federation should collaborate with the youth member organizations um, and take any extra measures that are necessary. And, and with player safety and respect, also player feedback, implementing a system where players can – yeah. Um, annually solicit and act on player feedback that is reported anonymously.
Yeah, absolutely. You know, when when this all dropped, the the official report was um, was was dropped to the public. Um, U.S. Soccer uh, released their their press release uh, linking to the full report, um, but within that also um, listed uh, some some very quick next steps um, in regards to some of the recommendations uh, on U S soccer's website. They say, quote, U S soccer is committed to thoroughly addressing the report's recommendations. And in the most immediate term, U S soccer will establish a new office of participant safety to oversee U S soccer's conduct policies and reporting mechanisms. They also list another bullet point saying, publish soccer records from safe sports centralized disciplinary database to publicly identify individuals in our sport who may have been disciplined, suspended, or banned. And they will also mandate a uniform minimum standard for background checks for all U.S. soccer members at every level of the game, including youth soccer to comport with USOPC standards. So um, already trying to um, address some next steps as quickly as they can. Um, I do know that coming out of uh, yesterday's big news day, there were also uh, additional media availabilities with Sally Yates specifically and U.S. soccer president Cindy Parlow Cohn as well. Um, and the two of those women, uh, ultimately just doing their best to, to continue to be open and, and transparent with the a public facing media and a virtual platform. Um, sitting in on, a, on those two calls was very, very heavy. It was very, very emotional. Um, Cindy Parlo Cohn is, is listed within this report as yeah. a former player and former employee of the Thorns organization who went through sexual harassment. And she is now U.S. soccer president and, you know, fielding these questions and, and, and taking these calls. Um, it's, an it's an incredibly tough time, I would imagine, right now uh, for anyone who's a former player specifically or current player at yeah. the moment. Um, and so I'm, you know, grateful that there was the opportunity to, to sort of um, hear these two and uh, feel any questions. I, I thought there were a lot of great questions from um, our colleagues, uh, Meredith Cash, Cash over at Business Exciter, sort of, um, you know, asked specifically about the scope of the investigation, that there, quite frankly, were, were teams and not necessarily listed within or mentioned within the report. And um, Yates ultimately elaborating on that a bit, saying that the scope was very specific in terms of the report, uh, because ultimately this report had to end. And that in itself is very heartbreaking um, to know that or feel as if so many wrongdoings in whether it's league wide or in prior leagues or within youth soccer could have made this ongoing and important investigation somewhat endless is heartbreaking. Um, I believe Meredith Cash specifically asked about club like the like Houston Dash um, and some of the things that they've been through. Um, Orlando Pride, obviously having Amanda Cromwell out. Um, so important to sort of hear, um, you know, the background on that. And uh, reading reading this report, we, we've talked about it a lot already, Lisa, on, on the personal level, how difficult it was to sort of, you know, read these, read these new details. Um, you know, but within them, not just hearing about... Uh, toxic environments and not just hearing about sexual coercion or misconduct, but um, the racism that players have suffered, black players have suffered within this league at the hands, you know, and, and, and miles, quite frankly, of, of some of these former coaches. Um, and that's a different, I think, uh, when we're talking about things that are systematic, there are things that, yes, affect all women and girls within 
within professional women's soccer, but there are also systematic things that impact black players specifically yeah. and women of color specifically. And you can't necessarily all women those types of moments. Um, and while this is still very new and still very fresh and uh, looking at some of the very quick next steps, I had noticed that there hasn't been mention of, of things to specifically offer support to uh, black players and women of color. And it was nice to be able to have a platform to ask Cindy Parlocone about that specifically. So I did ask her that in the, in, in the press conference and that that is something that is on their radar. She said that that is going to be included within um, even more uh, next steps that they are going to take uh moving forward that for now that they wanted to ensure that there were some recommendations that were addressed off the back. Um, but that's absolutely something I think that we need to continue to monitor uh, moving forward. You know, uh, yeah. there was talked about within this report specifically coming out of 2020, some of, some of the trauma that black players, you know, went through and stemming back from, from the summer of 2020 specifically, but you know, there's, there's been, those types of issues within women's soccer for for decades for for many years you know we were on here at one point um during july the summer of soccer of july promoting constantly promoting paramount plus's documentary with brianna scurry the only and wow. part of the reasoning that it was called the only was because she was remembering and retelling her experiences as often being the only black uh, woman on some of her teams or within some of these spaces. So um, very important to acknowledge um, at the end of this report that, yes, many things are systematic and there are many things that all of these players have suffered, um, but that there are systematic things that all, that are very specific to specific players. So yes. um, I'm hopeful um, and eager to, to see if there's going to be any anything new uh, that comes out of uh, the next steps moving forward after these uh, investigations, because uh, I think we're starting to see now a little bit players are also now that this report has dropped, it's, it's getting reaction yes. from, from all areas. And that's including players again, still current and former we've seen um, reaction to, to the report dropping Um there was a collective statement that was issued um, directly from Sinead Farley Manishim and Aaron Simon, um, quote, saying there have been too many years of inaction and too many empty promises made while players suffered at the hands of the league. No one involved has taken any responsibility for the clear role they played in harming players not the teams, not the league, and not the federation. They chose to ignore us and silence us, allowing the abuse to continue. It is time for action, accountability, and change. Owners who have driven a culture of disrespect, who are complicit in abusing their own players, have no place in this league and should be removed from governance immediately. This will be the first of many necessary steps to finally hearing our voices and keeping our players safe. So I think it's important for us to always bring it back to the players, right? And the victims of these very terrible things and to sort of make sure that we're highlighting those things. And um, as federations or leagues or clubs are um, finalizing or determining their next steps, it really sounds like the players are leaning in to their next step. And yeah. I think it's important to note that on the show here um they are deliberately talking about ownership at this point yeah I, th I think it's important to note that this investigation isn't digging into events that happened 10 years ago didn't happen before the nwsl yes it is it is digging into events that happened then but it is incredibly relevant. Although Sinead Farley and Manishim and Aaron Simon are no longer involved in the NWSL, they are no longer involved in this league because of uh, the situations that they were involved in and how they were not kept safe and, and trusted. But there are still many, many players and people that are still actively involved in the day-to-day -day workings of 
the NWSL of individual clubs in the league, whether those are players, owners, GMs, their names are in this report and they are still actively employed by clubs and players that are still actively playing in clubs. And that went on record in this, um, it, it, yeah. that's the the thing it, it spans from before the NWSL and players that are long removed from the league and from ownership roles and from um, positions of power, but there are still so many that are still involved and that's happening today that are still involved today as we do this. Yeah. It's, um, you know, I think it's, I think it's another form of, you know, courage and bravery, quite frankly, from the players. It's, um, it's not an easy position to be in to say we are going to ask and state that ownership specifically uh, remove themselves, you know, from from governance within the league specifically. I mean, the statement that we just read by Shanid Farley, Mana Shimon, and Simon, I mean, going back to the report uh, within the Chicago Red Star section of the report, there is uh, a player uh, who states within the report that their participation within this is uh, to ensure that Arnim Whistler is specifically held accountable, that she wants him removed. Um, so players are, uh, I think, very clearly um, leaning into their next step. And uh, I think that clubs, the league, and the federation um, should rightly take note. So yeah. we'll see. You mentioned Arnim Whistler at Chicago Red Stars, Portland Thorns owner Merritt Paulson, still the owner of, of the Thorns and the Timbers, as well as Gavin Wilkinson, who's the, the GM of Yeah, Portland. executives. Yeah, who's um, – yeah, so the, there's, a, there's a leaning into uh, looking at, at – at, people in what were supposed to be leadership roles, mm -hmm. quite frankly. So um, it's something that we're going to have to keep an eye on moving forward because that that's that's the next that really is the next phase of all this, right? The report has dropped what is going to come of this report and we will have to continue to, to keep an eye on that moving forward. Like Lisa has stated, I'll just remind that the report is public. Everyone has access to read it. Take care of yourself if you choose to go through it make sure you put your mental and emotional health first. Um, and we also just want to say thank you. Thank you to the players, um, both named and anonymous within this report for courageously speaking out. And um, we are thinking of everyone who is affected. So with that, uh, we would like to thank everybody for joining us and listening to Attacking Third.